Hi everyone, welcome to Pragati Vichar Liter uh, Poetry Festival 2022. On the occasion of World Poetry Day, we all gather here to celebrate our love for the poetry. And I hope through this event, we will be able to pay reverence to the poetry and its connoisseur. Welcome everyone. Today we have Gayatri Chavla, Damyanti Balwa Singh and Aftab Yusuf sir. Welcome all and I'm, I'm and we are very honored to have you on board today for the Poetry Festival. Welcome. So let's just start with the introduction first. First, we have Gayatri Lakhwani Chavla with us. Gayatri Lakhwani Chavla is a poet, translator, French teacher from Mumbai. She's graduated from Narsi Monji College of Commerce and Economics and pursued her master's in commerce from the Mumbai University. She received her degree from the Alliance Francis de Bombay and international debut in teaching from University of Cambridge. Recently, she had procured her master's in English literature from the Mumbai University, and her poems have been published in international anthologies and journals. journals. She has won several awards and the competition. Her debut book, Invisible Eye, was a long listed for Co Coaching Lit, Lit Fest Poetry Prize 2018. She lives in Mumbai with her husband, a teenage daughter, and four coated plants and her candid pack of carrot cards. So, hi, ma'am. How are you doing? Good evening. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Thank you. So, now, second, we have co panelist Damyanti Barua Singh. Damyanti Barua Singh is a writer for love and a Macron strategist for livelihood. A mother, an avid traveler, and an ardent reader, she loves stories. She writes short stories and poetry that explore the subtleties in the relationships and the nuances of life that can change one's own world. Her poetry has been published in anthologies by Tell Me Your Story, Story Mirror, and her, her short stories are published online platforms. She also works passionately for the social causes related to the education of children and women in the business. Hi, Damyanti, ma'am. Welcome. To, uh, thank you so much for participating in the Poetry Festival. Thank you. It was a lovely introduction. Thanks. And now we have third co-panelist, Aftab Yusuf Sheikh. Aftab Yusuf Sheikh is a poet, novelist, child, children's author, teacher, and a translator based in Thani. He teaches literature, history, and politics to high school and a degree college students. He started his writing journey at the age of eight and has ever since published a large number of his uh, published a large number of his work in anthologies and in general journals. Journal. Okay, sorry. He writes in English and Urdu. His first novel, The Library uh, Girl, was published in 2017, for which he was adjured the NE8X Author of the Year 2019, and his children books letter to Amit. 2019, published by Karagi Tales Company, was shortlisted for the Neve Book Award 2020. He was awarded the Poises International Award for the Excellence in Literature in 2020. So this is all we know about the Afta. And welcome, sir. Uh, we are so glad to have you today for the Poetry Festival. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. So let's just so let's just start with the recitation of the poetry today. First, uh, Aftab sir. Sir, please recite your poetry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for letting me start. So I won't have much you know, appreciations when I have heard them. So that's my turn. So I'll get it done fast. I would like to read two uh, poems. I hope I have that much time. Okay. I have, uh, one is from this book. Uh, moment Pura. The name of the poem is also Moment Pura. Moment Pura mm -hmm. is actually a place in, uh, in South Mumbai. Okay. Moment Pura. The weaver weaves a sigh as a sad thread is mismatched. His experience and art fail at the thoughts of his family's misery. The vendor of watermelons shouts in high pitch, sweet, sweet, but as better shall be his night when the policeman will come to collect commission. The dome of the mosque amidst the highs and lows of roofs says that God is always above, the rest are all low, 
however high they be. One woman on the terrace was a girl when I was a boy. We never said what we had to say. Ten years ago, I walked away, and I did the same this day. Far away, the Khada Parsi, still standing in his memory, he remembers his city well, while no one cares to know who was he. On approaching Michael Station, one mile, whether time and history see into lifeless beings and structures and live a life of their own. The iron grill beside the booking counter, where I stood with my father, and he stood with his. Generations changed after generations, but the iron bars are same. The harshness of a strike is less harsh than a hate word. Some truths are uglier than a lie. There is more to everything on earth than what meets the eye. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing Moment Pura. Actually, I would like to say one thing that. I've read your book, Moment Pura, and I really liked it. Uh, when you participated in Pragyatik Shah Literature Festival, that time I read it. Yeah, and it was it is amazing. I really like your poems. Yeah, and your second poem, please. I thought I had taken too much time. Sorry, no, no, it's fine. You have five minutes. It's fine. The second poem is a very uh, short poem. It's from this book, Tazi Talks, the earlier one. The name of the poem is Black Coffee Love. Okay. I call her my misfortune, and she frowns. I tease her more, and she cools down. She mentions our college days, reckons my timid diplomatic ways. This woman to whom my folks tied me, this girl they always wished beside me, touching her nape and pinching her nose. I then say to her, holding her very close, my child's mother, my black coffee. You must be bitter and dark and fear, but it is only you who drives my harsh winters away. Thank you so much, Abdul Sir, for sharing your beautiful story. So uh, now it's done, Gayatri Ma'am. Please, Ma'am, sign your poetry. This is a, a nature poem. Uh, it's called the universe in us. Did you know human souls survive in trees? Every time someone dies, the body decomposes, disintegrates into a grayish heap of ash that gets carried away by the wind into the choppy waters of the sea. The soul, on the other hand, rises like a phoenix from the ashes, beating in a soft, divine-like music. The sound of tinkling cowbells the whistling of a baby dolphin needing its way into a giant oak tree perhaps look at its leaves vein like just like that of a human hand breathing and swallowing breathing and swallowing the warm sunlight sieved through a bough of a tree what do these branches seek looking at the skies open mouthed gaping at the universe that roots them to mother universe Imagine they are weightless, dense souls of children holding hands, encircling the trunk of a past that's gone by, saving the last flickering of a fire spark, the last drop of water on a vagrant leaf, the soft scales of the last butterfly wings, chant the dervish's song, worship the water god Julilan. Alas, she reaps what we sow. The curse of the wicked man is eaten by the fiend himself. Thank you. Um, should I read the second one? Thank you so Thank much. You. Please, uh, second one, ma'am. Second poem, please. Okay. So this is a translation. It's a, a Sindhi Sufi poet Sachel Sarma's translation, co-translation from Sindhi to English. So I'm going to read you the English. Version. Okay. okay. Do you know lovers never die? They do not return to the abode of the body. They become insane and love drinking the goblet, brimming over. Lovers live forever, immortal, warring with the world. They lose themselves and themselves with wounds on their neck. Their voices lost. They speak of nothing but dwell in Allah. 
Years passed by reading in a sequence. Fasts were kept. Namaz was prayed. Those who were lost in themselves are unnerved by the trivial talks that reside outside them. They made a house abroad, not once spending a moment of time. Oh, these lovers can seek the truth, only dwelling in the desert. Every moment and every breath is an ode to the Mebu. Till the end, there is glory in it. Such you, and other the truth. God had showered him with eternal knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, Baidur, ma'am. It, it, your poems are very good. Thank you so much for sharing it with us. So at last, Damyanti, ma'am, please uh, share your poetry with us. Before I start, I, I'm so amazed to hear um, the fellow panelists here. It's wonderful to listen to such beautiful poetry. So uh, since tomorrow is um, Women's Day, so I'll, um, I'll take the liberty of reading out something which got published around women. So, okay. Fine. Uh, the poem is called The Pivot. Once she ruled the land, the hearts of men and every den. Swooshed with her beauty and bravery, she was the best that the universe could have. With choices abundant, wisdom and poise profuse, with guardians who called themselves, how could she lose, yet vulnerable she stood. Endowed with essie, responsible she was, to bear the next, to stand behind them. Homely she had to be for purity of souls. With affections and afflictions, she had surreal roles to play. Entangled in love and myths, restrained by force and fear, strapped her feet were in a steel shoe that hurt her, humiliated her, scarred her, stifled her. Grinding was it for every step. With vanishing hopes and plummeting strength, the choice was failure or death. The choice was there, but a difficult one, to break out of familiarity, to break the rules, to step into a world of chaos, to be herself, to confront the steel shoemakers, to never match the men, to fight a million battles a day, outside and within, every comfort could be hers if only she bowed out of the test. Peace was what she needed. Home she chose for herself and homemaker was she typed. Muddled in the new order, her solace was in others. Skilled, she became to tie her family again together. Busy she was nurturing identities and beyond, immersed in selfless love, lost in time. Finding her own identity turned into a frivolous dime. The place called home flourished, prospered with love and lives, health and harmony under her gracious command. Man couldn't believe how well she did, how important she was. So they molded the world to regard less of what she did. Temple of peace, care and love, all we want, all we did want, still homemaking became a paltry job. Universe has a reason to bring the two, give us eyes, ears, hands and legs and pairs too. What would it be like living alone to do everything on our own? Life is beautiful as long as we share and grow. With freedom to decide, to each our own, a promise is set in stone. Thank you, Dhamiranti, ma'am. It is a very powerful poem that you just recited. And, you know, as we all know that International Women's Day, this year theme, Break the Bias. And totally, your poem just portrayed that, you know, very precisely. Thank you, Dhamiranti, ma'am. So could you please repeat your uh, one more poem with us? Would like to? Yeah. You are on mute. 
<laughs> yeah. Since uh, we will be talking about uh, emotions today, so I'll uh, recite a short piece on um, anger. Okay. Huffing and puffing, pacing up and down. Your voice is echoing. Can you hear me now? Yeah, perfectly, yeah. Okay. Huffing and puffing, pacing up and down, she could feel the surge inside, the throbbing of veins, the shivering on the skin. She could taste the bitterness inside, the conflict of two minds, the blood on the lips. She could see her glowing eyes as red buttons, her eyebrows stretch till the temple. How ugly she looked. She clenched her fist to knock the mirror to the fore that could smash the only thing which always told the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Damianti, ma'am. Thank you so much. Your poems were beautiful and both poems portray, you know, somehow a women figure, a woman figure, actually, yeah. So thank you so much, everyone, for the poetry recitation. Now let's just start our discussion. So the, today we will be talking about the, you know, perspective. So our topic for the today's session is, are we slaves to emotions, to our emotions? And so my first question, every person wishes to have complete, you know, control over their emotions, but overpowering uh, thoughts are not like a stroll in the park. So what are your thoughts in this context? So Aftab, sir. So you will be starting with all right. Uh, you your question was uh, everybody wants to overpower their emotion. I don't know about everybody because as far as anybody who has understood the patterns of life, no same person will try to overcome their emotions. Okay. We are not slaves to our emotions, but we cannot. Uh, we have no power over our emotions. They, are, they belong to something within us which is not in our control. We can control the expression of our emotions. You can feel angry and you cannot show your anger. That is the different thing. But you cannot control yourself being angry or something that uh, ignites you, that sparks you, that causes you to feel anger. So as far as this goes, uh, I think that uh, we can never overcome our emotions as long as they are humans. Okay. Otherwise, it's fine. Uh, if we are human, we cannot get. In fact, the emotions is what makes us take care of everything. Uh, as human beings think that uh, they are superior to everything else on earth. So, in that case, also, if we don't uh, have emotions in between, then we'll do what we are already doing, ruining everything around us. So, I don't think we can overcome emotions. Okay. Thank you, Aftaf, sir. So, Damianti, ma'am, what would you like to say? Uh, you know, what just Aftaf, sir, said, and what do you think about this on this context? Too? So, I agree with Aftaf ji in the sense that, you know, control, the word control is a very, very strong word for emotions. And it is not, it is not like really, uh, okay, one fine day you wake up and you say, okay, I have my emotions under control. That that doesn't happen right and also um, i would prefer to call it managing my emotion than saying controlling the emotion yes there will be over influx of emotions uh, there will be times when uh, we will feel dominated by our emotions but um, the i mean the you know the the point is that you know how well we manage our emotions and that doesn't come through one day it doesn't come in a moment it comes through a series of practice guided um, not just guided external guidance but also self-guided practices that and habits on how you want to react to a particular 
um, or how you want to express a particular emotion. So if I'm feeling overwhelmed or if I'm feeling angry, then how do I express? So whether I express or not, as he said that, yes, it's a choice, but what choice do I make out here? And that is essentially, you know, where we call the line that, okay, this is one, but before everything, all of this happens, the first and foremost is to acknowledge and be aware about that emotion. Okay. You know, there is something, there is something that, I'm, that feeling. I'm feeling. This is something that is good, bad, ugly, whatever. So in that space, so awareness and then comes that, okay, I know that this emotion is at a moderate level. This is how I need to manage. This is at an overflowing level where I cannot, I'm getting overwhelmed and I'm doing certain things which are not supposed to be done and so on and so forth. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Damianti, ma'am. So, uh, Gayatri, ma'am, what do you think? So, uh, emotions are, uh, you know, they are inbuilt in, uh, in uh, every person. They're part of being human. So, you can't separate the two things. It's, um, it's part of, you know, the making of a human, of, of any person. So, emotions are basically a state of mind. So, you have your positive emotions, like you have empathy, you have gratitude, you have uh, joy, and then you have your negative emotions of anger, jealousy, insecurity and um, so there's no way you can control them because you're human they're definitely going to emote okay and your That's mind is just like a child you know it's going to sway it's for you to harness this with you you can't control it you've got to find a thin you've got to find the balance you've got to find the balance of uh, you know how you're going to emote or how you're going to react to a particular situation so uh, that's uh, what I feel. And uh, uh, of course, I agree with uh, Aftab and uh, um, Damayanti as well. That, uh, I mean, that you can't, because you're human, it's part of you. So this is the way you have to express yourself. You, the, the mantra in life, you won it if you uh, know how to balance and bring awareness and know what to say and know what to react. But uh, yes, that's that's what I think. That's what I think about emotions and control and all of that. Okay, so thank you, Vaitri, ma'am. So we just talked about uh, managing the thoughts. So my question is, next question. People believe yoga and meditation are the effective methods to control the body and mind and our thoughts. So do you really think that it actually helps or whether it's just a way to brag? So first with Damyanti, ma'am, please. So um, yoga and meditation, they've been there for a long, long time. And I personally believe that, you know, it helps if only if you believe in it, you have to believe in something to make it happen for yourself. So if I say that, okay, I don't believe in something and I keep doing it, it may never happen. It may never occur to me. Similarly, um, again, when we talk about this, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen like, okay, you do two sessions of yoga and you feel, okay, I am the master of the universe. That doesn't happen like that. Right. So it takes years and years of practice, years and years of dedicated training of the mind. So what is what does mindfulness or meditation do? It allows us to train our minds right? In a particular way, it allows us to predefine certain expressions that, okay, if I am, if I feel like this, I will do this. I'll take deep breathing. I'll do deep breathing. If I am feeling very restless, then possibly I can take a short uh, walking meditation or something like that. Yeah. So, so it is about that space. So first again, acknowledging, then again, figuring out that which one of the things to work with you. Again, there might be different spaces. Not everybody is uh, used to it. Then, and that is perfectly fine. As long as, you know, I don't think it's 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 sort of a brag or it's it doesn't work like that. It works, but yeah, if you ha you have to believe in it to make it work for you, we have That's to believe it. in everything to make things exactly, happen. Exactly, exactly. If you if you it is like you know that that book that we have, Secret, where you say that you know if you believe in it, the universe is going to conspire and you you know it will work yeah. towards it. Towards it, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Dunyanti ma'am. So, Gayatri ma'am, what's your take on this? You are on mute. Yeah. So, um, 
of course you guys the most ancient um, uh, you know uh, uh, hindu philosophy that we have where we use uh, a number of mental and physical exercises that they are, uh, we, we a lot of people implement it in their lives and of course meditation is there as well but uh, i don't think it's a brag uh, because um, one is you must uh, yes of course believe in it but there are times when you you know you sit down and okay nothing is happening i'm breathing and i'm trying to get in you know, peace and all nothing is happening but with time you know you will experience the magic you will experience it but it takes time and you have to of course believe in it and meditation is uh, something that you know you uh, it's bringing harmony to your mind body soul and it's a kind of a coming together of an awareness and an individual consciousness accepting and understanding that with the universal conscious everything that is outside is inside you so you have to be calm you know you have to calm down so definitely you know like yoga all these pranayam exercises that they do breathing exercise once you follow it it will take some time then it becomes a habit and then just like your affirmations it becomes you and then there is that is how you know you have you know develop uh, getting that harmony and a uh, peace of mind that they say you know how to uh, um, uh, what is react to a particular situation and um, also yes so there is of course pranayam and all these other breathing exercises that they do uh, living in the uh, you know stressful life that we have as as complex as we have made it with all the technology and all of that so it's important that we de stress we need an outlet you know to relieve our stress and i think these are the one of both are the best ways you can uh, handle your nerves and calm your nerves down and that's what i think about it yes thank you gaitri ma'am so tav sir what what's your take on this so if you notice what they said uh, in their answers uh, perhaps they didn't mention emotions at all and that is my answer that uh, meditation obviously helps it has been helping since we don't even know since when then people are since when they were doing this but meditation helps in curing the cause uh, the in curing the result of the emotions okay. not cure emotions if i am sad it cannot make me happy but the sadness what the sadness is causing to myself to my mind and my body that can be cured helping meditation I mean, like yoga and other such things but still even after yoga and meditation as i was born a human being i cannot be not sad when i have for reasons to be sad so that is the balance between the answers of all three of us that of course it helps but it can only help uh, in the you know what happens after the emotions that can be cured with yoga and meditation okay. of course nobody said that emotions will be cured by anything except by surviving it okay okay thank you aptab sir so so uh, now uh, this session is all about emotions so my next question is how can emotions shape you as an individual so gayatri ma'am what do you think uh, well see emotions are okay i'm i'm out here emotions are part of you okay now um, when you saying shape you as an individual a lot of things shape you as in the environment that you grew up in okay that uh, that makes you as a person so your opinions your preferences your food habits all depends or uh, is all influenced by the environment that you are in it's also so often the childhood that you grew up in that also affects the individual that you become for example if you come from a, a family where, where there is less of love or you have just one parent so you grow up feeling a lack of self love there's a lack of you do feel there is a some, uh, you do feel the need for love it kind of seeps into your psyche it's it, it's it, it is something that is just not spoken about you might not speak about it but you just feel it you feel the absence of a, of a parent and then that again definitely affects you as your in your affects you as in uh, shapes your uh, actually and accordingly uh, it 
affects your opinions. It affects what you are and what you become later. So that's what I feel. And um, so like, uh, so emotions, I, I guess I hope I've answered your question there. Also, like you grow up uh, often, uh, if you're, I guess, there's this thing about self-love, you know, and if you've got that as uh, when you're growing up, it's you do not look for another partner to validate that love. You have it in you, you know. All these things shape you as, a, as an individual. So all these emotions are there when you're growing up. Uh, if you've had a very difficult childhood, it will definitely affect you. If you're seen violent, if you haven't had a violent childhood, you will, uh, you know, uh, it will in influence your thinking, you know? So that's what I think. That's my take on it, yeah. Thank you, Gaitri, ma'am. So, Adam and ma'am. So, as um, Gaitri ji said, absolutely rightly so that, you know, emotions do shape us and I, and I believe it to the T in the sense that, um, Look at the world around us. It is all about emotions, how we interact with each other, how we perceive each other. Everything is clouded by our emotions, isn't it? So everything. So if love and hatred has the power to shape the world dynamics, then we are just humans. I mean, we are part of it. So of course we will be shaped. And that is how we start looking at the world, you know, um, the way we, uh, you know, see, grow up, the way we have felt emotions, the so yes, it does. Uh, one, it also, um, so one is that it shapes us in terms of the person that we want to be and or what we become. And the second is that, you know, at times it also shapes our perspectives um, to a large extent. And that can sometimes be very good, sometimes be on the other side of the spectrum. So yeah. yes, um, shaping emotions, shaping ourselves, yes, of course. But at times it could be not so, uh, you know, not, not the space that you want to be and which is where comes in um, help that you, you have people to talk to, you have... Um, you have, we talk about this all the time, mental well-being, mental well-being, or we talk about it in schools that, you know, emotional uh, well-being of a child. So earlier we used to always talk about IQ. Now we also talk about something called EQ. So all of this is, is trying, is our effort to build a healthy emotional us in ourselves, in our, in our future generation. So yes, of course it does, it does shape us. And we are trying really hard to shape us better. Thank you, Dimitri, ma'am. So my next question is for Aftab, sir. How does poetry communicate at an emotional level? Mm, well, uh, when, when a person is trying to say something, they normally say it in prose. Okay. But when, they, when their emotions come in between, it turns out to become poetry. So... When simple prose is uh, comes to the filter of poetry and becomes uh, filter of emotions and becomes poetry. So uh, I think that whatever you feel, you are trying to. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's, uh, it's a very philosophical kind of thing. I, an explanation can also be only philosophical, not really practical or material kind of. I I saw something. I felt that I should write about it because that thing broke and I wrote it and then somebody else read it and that person felt the same or, or, or somewhat similar feelings. Now we, both of us have the same emotions. It is possible that both of us never knew each other and we never know each other. But we felt the same things. So that is what the human connection and emotion. That is what poetry does. Otherwise poetry is just words like prose. Right. If, 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 it, if it breaks the emotions in you, if you feel, if it, if it makes you, like I said, I wrote something thinking or something or somebody. And the person who read it is now thinking or something and somebody else. But the emotions are the same. And that is what makes poetry very powerful. Because it can make use of words 
and connect two people. Maybe they are not from the same century. Maybe they are not from the same era or same place, same continent, whatever. But two human beings can be connected by poetry and the chain in between is emotions. The words don't connect, actually the emotions behind the world connect. That's what I think. Thank you, Aftab sir. It was a very good answer. Thank you. So, Gayatri, ma'am. Yes, uh, that was uh, actually uh, um, very well said, Aftab. I would like to just add up, add something to that. That, um, you know, how um, Frank Kafka says that, you know, if the book, a book should be like an axe for the frozen sea within us. So you have to have that kind of a reaction. So it's a uh, poetry is magic. And the words, you know, they just take, I feel they just take hold our hands and they take us to a place. They take us either to a childhood or to a faraway land, or they just take you to another uh, a place altogether. And it poetry at uh, uh, caters to all the five senses that we have. So, so touch, sight, hearing, smell, taste. So I want to just do this little exercise with you. Just please, you can close your eyes for a minute and listen to this. Okay. And because I can hear the faint flutter of birds in the tree that stood in the depth of my heart. And that's Jayantra Mahapatra for you. So you can open your eyes now. So you can see when you just heard, you just have to hear that flutter of birds and your heart goes a flutter, you know. I, I, as poets, you just have to listen. So it's your what you hear, what you touch, what you smell. All of so it caters to all the five senses. That's what poetry does. And I think what, uh, who else but poets would know that it's magic, you know. That's how that's how we write, and that's our uh, uh, that's how uh, uh, it works for us. Or if you see how lonely it is on God's sea with no shore in sight. And we, like ships in the night, navigate only by the grace of his light. That's Rumi. So it's touching your soul right there, you know. So there's no two ways that, of course, it, uh, I hope that answers your question. That poetry is all about emotions. Right. Yes. Right. I totally agree with you. Thank you, Gaiji ma'am. So, Damianti ma'am. So, I think both of them have said uh, most of it. I'll just um, add to it. So, um, in as uh, William Wordsworth once said that, you know, poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. It takes its origin from emotions recollected in tranquility. And that just sums up every bit of it, that poetry is intense, poetry is layered, and poetry allows us to um, read in between the lines. So you don't really need to, um, you know, communicate or say a lot of things to say, express that action of one point to another point. And that's the beauty, that's the magic. So I'm sure uh, the poets, I mean, will agree to this, that that's the magic, that's the beauty. And like, you know, I just read uh, something the other day and uh, it says it, it, it's from uh, Virginia Woolf. It is picked up from some, uh, some part. It says, I am in the mood to dissolve in the sky. Okay. It's only this much. Okay. When you listen to this, you will have a different interpretation of it in your mind because you are in a different zone. I will have a different, I will believe it differently. Uh, Gayatri ji will believe in differently and Aftar ji will believe it differently. And that's the magic. So I think that sums up uh, the magic of poetry. <laughs> True. And you precisely put the, you know, the perspective session, the main message through your this sentence. Yeah. The perception. Right. Yeah. So thank you so much. So my last question before winding up with the session. So, you know, when it comes to Indian literature, Indian poetry, we have different ras, right? So we portray our emotion, you know, uh, by portraying different ras in Hindi. But there is a, when we compare the Western poetic language and Indian poetic language, there is a difference. 
right so how can we differentiate the emotions between the uh, indian and the western poetic language so my first uh, this to uh, aptab sir so what's your take on this well frankly i don't see any difference uh, the nowras are there in them also we caught it we recognize it that's the only difference because uh, everybody feels the same anger same you know when when we lose somebody whom we love or when you are your your training or boss is passing away and somebody, and somebody you want him to stay with you are going away from somebody like that you feel the same wherever you are that okay. as far as emotions are concerned concern we are made up of emotions so humans are emotions so every human feels the same emotion it may be that their reaction or the way of handling it is different so as you mentioned the ras so the now rasa which are there they are in every human being everybody experiences them yes poetry can be different and that is because the uh, experience of that those emotions is different because of our cultural differences and this is beautiful thank you aptab sir so guys remember what's your take on this Uh, again like I, i i don't feel there's a difference between the two i feel emotions are universal so it's just that uh, sometimes when you read words now i feel like if i'm reading uh, like i use for my poems i use the word um papad or i use koki or i use these hindi words or i use a word something like ghotan so now uh, the way i would immediately resonate with that hindi word would be maybe i my heart will tug more towards that but you know uh, but otherwise the way you react to every other uh, you know a, 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 every other poem is just the way you react to it so if you uh, you read something you feel sad you feel sad i don't differentiate between the you know the like the western and the indian it's, it's in universe a poem is a poem you can connect with any poem anywhere you know you, uh, and uh, it's just that sometimes from where you come that right now as of now i feel if somebody says mitti i immediately can think of the rain and the monsoon rain monsoon and all of that so i would resonate with it more personally but otherwise the emotions are the same for you know both the west east doesn't matter it's one word okay thank you so much gayatri ma'am so damyanti ma'am um so when we talk about um, languages you know yes poetry yes. is essentially emotions in intense form just what we talked about right but every language has a ring to it i mean the audio so when you listen to a language it has a certain rhythm to itself it has a certain tune to itself so the way a russian accent will be it will be very different from a us counterpart of uh, the way a marathi will talk or read a marathi poem will be very different from a north indian reading a marathi poem or a bengali reading a marathi poem so these are these it's not about cultural differences or it's not about you know um it's not about different emotions we are feeling the same emotions we, we but it's just about the fact that we have grown up with that language so it rings faster in our ears oh, yeah. so but uh, again in school we have read william wordsworth we have read um, you know uh, kelly we have read uh, all of these authors and even today when we read contemporary authors as well each poem will have a different ring to it because they the kind of words that they are using that adds to the whole flow so the language if you talk about the semantics of the language it's the rhythm the sound the figuratives the figures of speech that you use in that so a figure of speech which is, which you use in hindi or a urdu is is will be different it might mean similar things but it doesn't give you that exact precise because it it can't be the exact translation so when we talk about zindagi it gives a different flavor to the whole thing and when we say life it gives a different flavor to the whole thing so they are different flavors they have different uh, they they bring in different imagery so that's the beauty of language i think i mean in terms of the language language 
but if you talk about poetry in terms of the understanding in terms of the matter in terms of the theme the emotions it's all same it's universal it doesn't vary i mean it it doesn't become sadness to happiness when we change continent it remains where it is and it is expressed in their you know in in a different format that's that that's my take thank you damanti ma'am and i totally agree with whatever you just said so uh i would like to thank all of you that aptaf sir damanti ma'am and gayatri ma'am thank you so much for coming here and you know share your thoughts and expression towards the poetry and what is poetry actually the significance of the poetry and sharing your thoughts and i've learned so much from you guys today so thank you so much and i hope that people will also get in this inspired from your thoughts so, yeah thank you thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you so much thank you have a good have day bye thank you bye.